Uh, it's a little bit of give and take. Hey everybody, it's Anne. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips and uh, disembodied, disembodied Voice Justin is with us, at least temporarily today. I'm going to put him in my ear just to make sure he is not Justin from Beyond the Grave. Um, how are you all on this splendid Wednesday? I'm actually going to step away in the same. Okay, have fun Justin. Justin is meeting about the new studio. So he will be distracticated, and it'll be just us. Sorry for the delay this morning, guys. I actually was waiting on Justin for once. I was I was only like two minutes late, and then, you know, Justin was more late. So Reaper Standard Time is not just a function of Anne. It is also a function of Justin and Reaper meetings. So we can blame, let's just blame Reaper on this one. Let's just blame, let's just blame the Reaper meeting. It's bound to be Ed. Ed was talking. Ed was telling an old story, and everybody got distracted. Let's just, that, I think that's the reality, having been in many Reaper meetings. <laughs> hey, Alba. Hey, Nomad. Yo, Mathophile. And Twisted Oma. And Corinico. Yo. So yeah, I'm going to blame, uh, I'm going to blame Ed. I know that, that, I mean, it is Reaper, part of the Reaper employee handbook to blame Ron. So maybe we should blame Ron instead. Because I'm still a Reaper employee, so, you know, item number, like, three on the on the uh, Reaper employee handbook is, uh, you know, blame Ron. So, and then item number four is unless there's another employee who has recently left and is thus ripe for being blamed for everything. <laughs> but mostly it's blame Ron. Ah, David is indeed here. He was, he was happy that he got to watch my stream today, which means that he's inevitably going to get some last minute meeting invite. This is what usually happens. I'm, like, kind of impressed that this, like, fire giant is getting, like, things done on him. Uh, he's, he's, like, looking like a fire giant. Like, he has, you know, like, he's, he's slowly getting painted. And this thing is immense. So, yes, Ron gets blamed for everything. Rightfully so, Twisted Oma. Yes, blame Ron. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's it. See, all, you're now all in, uh, in alignment with the Reaper employee handbook. Very good. Alrighty. Did Ron, does Ed talk about that on uh, on Reaper Live a lot? Blame Ron. If not, he should. Let's go to let's go to minicam and chat while we paint. I want to finish doing some of this blue stuff today. I think I want to at least block out some blue stuff. Figure out where my blue stuff is going to go. Yes, unless it's server problems, then we blame Bug Lips. Yes, that is absolutely valid. I'm all on board for that. I actually just ran out of a bottle of pure white, finally. Ran out, dead out, of a bottle of pure white. I need to put together a reaper paint order. Make sure I have enough. Can't, can't uh, ever have too much of pure white. Although I think I have an almost untouched bottle sitting over here. <laughs> so it's like I've got so many. There's certain colors that I seem to um, pile up. I seem to keep grabbing. Do, do, do. Yeah, the giant keeps getting more and more filled in. He's a, he is very large project. Hey, MG, thanks for the sub. Almost a year, you're almost to your anniversary, sub -aversary. <laughs> That's awesome. Fantastic. All right, so everybody really wanted to know what the heck I'm gonna do with these bracelets. I don't know, but I guess we might jump into them today. I do wanna do a lot of the blue, the blue metal though. I wanna get that kind of uh, in there. It does help, uh, as you can see, I think you'd agree, that having that blue tone, even though it's a very slight blue tone, does help make the giant not look like just one big swath of orange and brown, which is definitely something you, you need. I think you do need a, a little bit of contrast to bring it up. I mean, analogous color schemes, I'm, I'll admit, I'm not always very attracted to because of that, because I feel they lack a warm and cool balance, um, at least the level of it that I like to see. Uh, that said, 
there are some analogous color schemes that are really beautiful. And obviously you can do a mono or duochrome color scheme that's that's quite analogous, that still looks gorgeous. I mean, sepia tone is a good example. A lot of times if somebody's painting a, a miniature in, in sepia, like an old time photograph, they will actually use warmer and cooler browns in order to get a little bit of variance. I think Derek Schubert does that a bit or has in the past because he's painted a couple of sepia tone models, mostly the Reaper Cowgirls, the Sophie Cowgirls, which is totally uh, a great choice. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have those backup. I'm pretty sure I have a backup of black and white um, around here, but I probably should check because I have been using pure black a bit uh, lately for bases and stuff, base edges and uh, some other stuff, like when I'm starting really, really dark and I want to go up blue. But uh, yeah, otherwise, so let's go. Let's mix up our paint. Let's get our painting butt in gear. I'm doing a well palette today. Wet palette frustrated me a little bit yesterday. I, I maybe, I, I think I probably, the problem is the two types of wet palette paper that I have are parchment and the Masterson stuff. And the Masterson stuff leaks too much fluid back into the sponge and the parchment paper leaks too much fluid into the paint. So obviously I need to find a different wet palette paper if I am going to be at all happy with my wet palette over the long term. Because I'm fine with my wet palette with parchment in it for the first half hour. <laughs> but during the second hour, the second half hour and then leading into the actual, like, you know, third half hour, the second hour, then it's definitely getting really thin. So if I'm trying to do any wet blending, I just hate not having control over it. Maybe I'm just a control freak painter. That's probably what it comes down to, right, Kiri? Kiri's coming for Pettins. Hi, Pettins girl, what's up? Shiny head? Oh, we left the door open. Oh, that means we can be a distracted Kiri today. Well, I'm pretty sure that we're going to have a Kiri emergency today, so just be aware. I'm, now there's dog fur everywhere <laughs> flying in front of my camera because <laughs> I was petting the dog. Your fault, doglet. Um, but yeah, yeah. Hey, Motor City Ray. It's good to see you. Happy hump day, indeed. Hey, planner. So I'm mixing up. I'm mixing up a couple of mixes here. I've got um, kind of a, you can see my blue liner plus white. That's mostly, a, it's about a two to one, I'd say. Blue liner to white. White influences blue liner a lot because blue liner is a thinner paint. And although it's got a heavy pigment load, the pigments involved are somewhat transparent. So white does make a high impact on it, um, which is useful when you're trying to use it as I am, as a blue. And highlight it up with the white. It also avoids a little bit of that transparency issue because of the black pigment. With most blues, blue pigment is some of the smallest particular size, and so it can be hard to uh, blend it up smoothly. But because you've got that black in there with the blue liner, it somewhat mitigates that problem. You still can get a little bit of that, you know, hard to get away from brush strokes thing, but not nearly as bad as some of the other more transparent blues. <laughs> You're ahead of the class. <laughs> All right. I need to touch up skin tones at some point, but I need to also like finish skin tones. So I'm not too worried right now. Uh, mostly I want to get some of this blue stuff touched up. I'm not going to attach his arm. I'll tell you that because I still need to do the other side of the sword. Um, and I need to finish out like the edge of the sword to make it the, have that all the have that glow. So that being said, I don't want to attach this because it's much easier to paint this sword when it's off. It's much easier to paint it when it's like this than to try to paint it when it's on the giant. And this is the second rule of, uh, of really, should you attach things or should you not attach things? Should you paint things first and then glue them on or should you glue them on and then paint them? Um, when you're working on a big broad surface like this, that will be awkward to paint like details and freehand on, like if you're gonna do something like this, that's gonna, anything that, that result, that needs fine work um, that is going to be awkward to try if you have it glued on. That's where you want to paint it first and then glue it on. Um, quite the most famous version of this is Dragon Wings, where you, you know, if you want to do any texture at all on them, you really don't want to glue them on right away. Any spots, any patterns, any texture, you know, any blending. It's much easier to paint wings when you've got them separate from the model than when you put them on the dragon, especially if the wings are up you know, and out, and if they are kind of close together in the back, then it gets really a pain in the butt to paint the inside um, surfaces. Hey, Iggy. 
Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like why I'm making this decision to not glue this together yet. And that means that I'm probably going to leave this part unpainted so I have something to hold it by until like later on. I, I do know what colors I'm making this. And this little handle is going to be a lot easier to paint when it's on the model. Because once you've got it there, it's not behind the giant's head or anything. It's sticking out in the middle here. So if I've got him glued into his torso, then it's actually fairly easy to get around and paint this. So I know that I can get away with just holding on to this and painting everything else. The other thing you could do is, of course, drill a pin into this and, uh, you know, and just mount it on something or squoosh it down into a bunch of blue tack, I suppose, but the pin would be a little bit easier. The other thing that David found out yesterday, and I'm going to share this with you, is that this guy's actually a finger puppet. So really, you have to just hold him like this to paint him. It is evident now. Like, I don't know how I could have avoided doing this before now, but he stuck him on his finger yesterday and was, like, doing the finger puppet thing. And so, yes, we now know this is actually a fire giant finger puppet. And this is how you should paint it. So figure out a finger that fits and is comfortable and just paint it that way. Obviously. Personally, I still prefer to hold his lower parts. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's see here. I want to paint the back part of this. I probably could get away. There's nothing really blocking. I just like to paint over a little bit. So let's just get that blue liner and get it laid down in here actually a bit of blue liner and white it seems whatever I did yesterday I just like to paint over into this crack here before I attach it like down into this area because once you've got it glued in you got to stick your brush down into that and it just makes more sense to me to paint this edge before I do that anything that's hard to paint once you glue anything on so like this under area do it while it's easy to reach now I don't have to worry so much about doing like details find details down here except for maybe this um the nmm area under this shoulder so i'll look at that and see how hard it is going to be to paint once i get all this base coat down and these big plates i had decided were also going to be blue liner they do have edges so i can edge them with gold and i may do that uh, just to break things up because I do kind of like that gold edge next to the dark skin. But I want I want areas of blue on the bigger plates on this. I want it to look like iron or blue, very black, blue, black steel. So I'm going to paint up. And I'm going to paint a little bit into the sockets here just to make sure that there's no, like, plastic showing once I socket stuff in. Once I put that cloak on, I don't want any plastic. So I'll probably actually take my blue liner and put a dark shadow here. So that once I put the cloak in, I don't have to worry about lining up into that area. I'm going to actually focus a little better here. Yeah, this is not going to work as usual. The camera is like, oh, there's a palette. I want to focus on the palette. No, you must focus on the giant. I'm sorry, camera. There. Much better. Morning, Saul. Monster finger puppets should be a thing. I'm certain there are out there. I'm certain. I thought all finger puppets were monster finger puppets. Are all finger puppets monster finger puppets? I don't know. Look, I see, it, like, I'll I'll use him as a finger puppet while I'm doing this. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had Sesame Street finger puppets, I think, and I guess if you count Grover as a monster, the Cookie Monster is definitely a monster. His name says he is. Although now apparently he's a fruits and veggies monster, which is so sad. Ah, oh no, floor. That's okay. Good day, dog father. There we go. All right, and then there's that little hollow in here. Um, I don't think, let me see. Yeah, yeah, the cape does go into that area. So let's see what the cape actually covers and what I'm going to probably want. All right, so I do want to get this little fissure in here. You can see it. You don't want any plastic showing in here. You can see that past the cape, the other part, likewise. So we'll get in here and put this, put some dark on this. Dark shadow. It's all you need. I have blue liner open, so I'm using blue liner. I could just as easily use walnut or something like that. All righty. 
And also, um, obviously, we are going to paint the cape uh, before we attach it, because uh, otherwise we wouldn't be able to paint any of this. <laughs> um, I do not, I have not chosen what to do if I want to do texture or just do a, a rough texture on the inside of this. We may do um, some kind of leathery texture. Haven't decided if it's heavy cloth or leather. It is not patterned like leather at all. Um, and it does have all these plates. So you have to ask yourself at that point is, are, is this a hide with all these uh, scales on it? Or is it actually like an armored cape? Um, and you could paint it either way you wanted to. Alrighty. I think I've got maybe everything in place to glue this guy, which would be nice. Yeah, I think I'm going to glue him. Glue him into his torso. That way I can hold the torso, which has a lot less paint on it, and I can stop, like, feeling my hand cramping by holding the little areas. And I'll stop uh, rubbing stuff off of all the other stuff. So, since this is a big socket with a lot of wiggle room while it's deep, um, I'm going to probably use my gel paint, my gel glue. It's not a perfect fit. Whenever I have a big socket that has a bit of wiggle room, and he and he does have a, have a little bit of, of wiggle room in there, because it's such a big socket, I will use gel glue. If I have something that's a much tighter fit, then I use my Zappagat medium because I want that kind of capillary action where the glue, like when I'm pinning, I tend to use this because I want that glue to go into that tiny pinhole and, uh, and really stick the pin in there. So those are the two types of glue I use. This is the ultra gel. I figure if I'm going to go gel, I may as well go super gel. So for things like this, where there's a large fitting area, Let's see if I can get it there. I'm almost out in this particular bottle, but I have a backup. And the other thing that's nice about the Ultra Gel is you can put it exactly where you want it. Gel super glues are typically a little bit more brittle. Like, they don't have quite the strength of um, finer super glues, but they're also a lot more controllable. And, of course, they gap fill. So, in this case, since this isn't a perfect fit, it makes sense to use this. And to try to hit all the areas that you'd think... So now when I insert him in here, this is going to slide down a bit. Hopefully it will fill the gap. I've managed to get the tongue well glueified, so that should work well. Press him down. We're going to let him sit just for a second. Make sure we've got him kind of positioned on his torso nicely. He fits in there snugly. He lines up with everything. His, his little plates on his sides keep him from sliding down further. We'll let him sit there while we get our colors kind of doctored. We're going to do some of the black iron today. I want some pure black in addition to my blue liner just for why not. Ah, I do have an extra bottle of pure black. That's good to know too. It's only a partial bottle though. I'm not quite as good. <laughs> That's really funny, planner. No twisted oma. I will not give you that many sanity points. Dragon hide cape with iridescent scales, indeed. He would have to have killed the cloud giant for that to happen. I think cloud giant would have this guy for breakfast. Or a cloud, uh, cloud dragon, sorry. They were the ones that had the iridescent, like, cloud colored scales. Or mist dragon, I guess the mist dragon also did. It's from Monster Manual 2 or something back in the day. Do, 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 do. Water. Just getting a little bit of pure black so that I have something non-blue to put in my darkest shadows. <laughs> uh, Mathophile, I don't think I would make it like steel. I think that would be really boring. Um, personally, I, I think I would rather do a color a pattern in colors. Um, so I might do some of the blued steel, but, but then also some red or some orange or some gold or all of the above. Um, but I haven't gotten there yet. So my only thing is, do I want to do leather on this? But I don't think I do. I think I would rather have it be like a cloth cloak with inlaid, like sewed on scales of like in a colored metal or enameled metal. And also may I say, this is the most annoying mold line ever. Like, no way are you going to be able to get most of that. Like, it's tempting to just paint over it, but I probably would actually have to green stuff over it to wipe it out completely. I could maybe use some knife work, but when you're dealing with this, with a mold line over a complex pattern, like straight across, like, what were they thinking? Um, 
and there's you really just can't get your you know your your file in there then usually green stuff is the answer just tiny bits of green stuff to cover over that mold line enough so that it doesn't show <laughs> no, you do not get any sanity points for trying. Yeah, it is a very nasty mold line. That's then the only way to deal with it, I think, is going to be green. I mean, cause you, because you've got such detail that's crisp here, you can't really use any other putty. Um, you want something that lets you sculpt, essentially, because you're going to have to sculpt over the top of that mold line. So trying to use something like Aves, probably not ideal, um, or Milliput, just cause, I mean, cause they're kind of mushy, right? And they're also not going to be sticky and you really need to get something really sticky so you can put a tiny bead of it on here and then use it to disguise that without losing any texture. Uh, so I think personally, I think that green is best for that sort of thing. Alrighty. Hello, Mr. Giant. Well then let's block in some shadows. I guess I can see how this might be metal. I thought yesterday that this breastplate might be leather and I was annoyed at it, but I can, I guess I can see that it might be, uh, might be metal. It's got more, a more angular surface than it looked like at first. Like I'm outlining kind of the facets of it right now. Just kind of want to block in some shadows. It is an unusually shaped piece. There are a bunch of unusually shaped pieces on this model, so it's good practice for figuring out where the light will fall. Good practice or insanity inducing, you know, one or the other. What I call good practice, some people may disagree with. Usually it's like, oh yeah, that's good practice. Oh yeah, that's gonna drive me crazy. It's usually the same thing. All right, let's see if I've got light coming down there. My main light is going to be like here. Well, and now I'm seeing like there's a dent here in the armor. So maybe it is really ar really meant to be metal. I'm going to have a bit of, and there's another dent here. Now I'm just kind of blocking in like, where's my light going to be? If this really is metal, how is it going to go? And where is my shadow going to be? Probably here. And I'm using pure black when I need a really dark shadow. Because pure black is still just a tiny bit more flat and, and dead than the uh, blue liner is. So if I need something that is absolutely black for like a dark shadow on, especially when you're working with really dark metal like this, your shadow's got to go down to black, I think. Man boob armor. Yeah, well, he definitely has these little uh, kind of angular things where his pecs would be. So I'm just going to say that they have made him man boob armor a la Batman. We're just going to go there. We're just going to go there. Batman. Uh, which Batman was that? That was the uh, oh, I, Heath. What's his name? Batman that had the, the muscle sculpted armor. That was really a little bit um, overdone. Got to get down in there a little bit. All right. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes, missing the all-important armor nipples. Well, we could we could go there, Crispies, but I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna just you know not. <laughs> George Clooney with the rubber nipples. There we go. There we go, Clooney. I couldn't remember. I've seen a great many Batman movies over the years. Michelle Pfeiffer equals best cat woman ever, in my opinion. Alrighty, so we got a highlight, then we've got a shadow, then we've got another highlight. We'll start getting a little bit of secondary light in there. Just pretty much moving through all these metal areas and trying to block in, just like I did up on the hat, and I haven't done the back of the hat yet, but we're getting there. Although there I may do orange because it's right up next to that sword. But first thing to do with this much metal NMM is to just kind of block in where are my basic light and shadows. 
you could just do this with your first coat if you wanted to, but I tend to like to put down my base and then, then I can wet blend and not have to worry about coverage if I'm using slightly lighter coverage paint. But blocking in like this at the early stages allows you to see if it really looks like metal to you. And then if it doesn't, it allows you to troubleshoot and correct when you don't have that much paint down on the figure. And since it's all rough, you don't feel like painting over it is a big deal. Whereas if you try to paint it and then you look at it after and you're like, oh, the light isn't working, then you're going to feel really like, you know, oh, I put so much work into this, I don't want to paint over it, right? He formally apologized for that Batman. <laughs> I didn't realize that, Alba. <laughs> oh... I decided to, um, this is his waist. Like, this is how Wayne Reynolds designed the fire giants. He did our concept art for a lot of our giants, Frost and Fire. And so Val, um, since Wayne, and Wayne, if you don't know him, is the guy who does the cover art for Pathfinder. Uh, so he does do a lot of elaborate armor patterns. But so what you've got is a breastplate over a, essentially like kind of a, a big belt that you could paint any way you wanted. Um, but probably also, you know, at least some... Probably leather, but could be actually metal. Probably leather. I'm going to paint it red, I think, um, with maybe a, a metal metal trim or um, something that looks vaguely like metal trim. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, fire, they're fire giants. Who knows? This is not realistic armor. <laughs> uh, no, no freeze, Dilbert Dog. We only do freeze on this show when we, uh, when we do our AMA and giveaway, uh, which we do when we get to 100 subs. Every 100 subs we do. Last time we got to give away a big dragon, three big dragons, because we've been aiming for a 100 sub goal lately. Uh, but it's always on a Friday. And I think we're in the early stages of reaching our next 100 sub goal. We'll have to see. We get a few subs every show. So my goal is kind of to hit one of those big giveaways every month or so. Gives people a lot of time to think of questions to put in my AMA channel on the Reaper Discord. And then on that day, we go and we answer as many questions as possible. Um with demos as needed and we also do giveaways but otherwise we don't just do giveaways on this show i want i want this show to actually pay <laughs> to actually make money for reaper so that they'll let us continue doing this let's see here so right now you what you can see is that i've got my light sourcing a little bit off probably i need my highlight to go a little bit farther over here um, cause if you follow the light down the front, it actually should hit about here. So it should go a little bit over. Now there might be a little bit of light that's being cut off by the beard here because this is a little recessed. So you got to keep that in mind, but there should still be some light falling there. So I am going to carry it over a bit and see if it looks a little bit better because right now it's, it's definitely like not quite right. There's that, that kind of a sliced bit. Let's see here. And I mostly, I think I want the light to fall here. So if there is a shadow, it would probably be right here. So I should be able to pick up my light more like right there. That's in line with the light that's coming down from above. And then I probably want to extend a little bit, just a bit. And then I like, let's see, there's going to be a shadow under there. Bring in a darker shadow. Oh yeah, no show this Friday. Um, yes, thanks for reminding me, guys. Uh, Justin has to put a whole day into getting the the new studio set up for ReaperCon. So no stream on here on Reaper Miniatures Twitch, but over on my um, twitch.tv slash painting big channel, I'll do, I'll do a stream. Whenever we cancel here, um, I'll pick up a stream over on my channel so that we can all, you know, still get our, our fix. I might even do two streams that day. We'll see. We'll see if I'm in the mood for a marathon. I actually have a lot of other stuff to get done, though, so maybe not, because I have Patreon stuff I need to get done. So we'll see. I'll do at least one stream Friday morning-ish around this time. Because it's my habit, and I like to keep it in place. I would feel weird if I wasn't streaming. I would feel like it's the weekend. All right. Eh, eh, that's a little bit weird. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think I need to adjust it.
because this is a rounded surface too. This is a weird kind of, uh, I think I'm just going to go crazy here. Let's see. Let's see. Let's just try to block it in as a rounded surface where it's more rounded toward the bottom, more sticking out toward the bottom. We're going to ignore that little gouge line for now. We're just going to get that highlight in. Then we're going to do our shadows and see how it looks because I really felt like that wasn't right. Now this is where I talk about getting this blocked in in the beginning so you don't mind painting over it, then adjusting it, playing with it, making it look right. And you've got to look at a lot of metal to like get a feel for what looks right. And sometimes you can ask people around you um, if it looks like metal, but if you're asking like laymen who aren't painters, I mean, sometimes they'll be like, yeah, not really. Cause they can't get past the matte paint, but yay. No sleep for Justin Collins and John. Yep. Exactly. Oh yeah. I saw there was a, there were hurricanes coming in. I got a new follower. Good, good. Excellent. I like getting new followers. Yes. Also the name of my Patreon. Yes. My wonderful, wonderful Patreon, which I need to do some videos for this week. Do, 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 do. All right. That's a little bit better. That's reading a little bit better, but now I need my shadows. Remember we need our dark shadows right next to you think circles are pointless. I like, I like circles. What were we talking about? Parabolas last night, David? Hyperbolas. Hyperbolas? But I thought it was parabolas and not hyperbolas. I, mean, I thought it was like hyper hyperbole. Hyperbolas and parabolas are different shapes. Oh, are they? We were talking about the shape of the shadow that a candle made on the wall because the flame of the candle was below the round lip. Right. See, this is how nerdy we get, guys. I'm sure Math File would be happy to explain why that shape is a hyperbola. <laughs> so does hyperbole come from hyperbola? Is it the I same root? I don't know. I, I, being a word nerd, am far more interested in that because I am not a math nerd. See, I got some paint into my white finally. Somebody was saying it was magical that I never got, uh, when I dipped my brush in another color, I never got any of the original color into it, but I just did. So you can see, even Anne. Hyperbole literally means throwing beyond from the prefix hyper meaning beyond and um, the root bully, which is a throwing, a casting, the stroke of a missile, bolt, or beam. Interesting. Interesting. Um, yes, uh, in our, uh, it's, uh, I tend to like, for this kind of blued steel thing, I'm using blue liner and white, though the shadows are, are pure black, because I want something a little bit stronger for that. So now we got, remember, uh, kind of a secondary highlight coming in at the edge. Like a couple of secondary highlights. And then I want probably, that's looking, that's reading a little better. So it is Yeah, planar's same, awake. It is the same root, actually. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Hyperbola is also literally a throwing beyond. Um, it's just a figurative and a literal. And of course, the adjective version for both is hyperbolic. Yes. Interesting. A little bit of highlighting on those little gouges. And I'm going to take a pure black and I'm going to come in and get those uh, gouges really lined out. <laughs> this is terrible planer. Oh no, the Dave and Ron bot. No. Oh, Dragon Eyes got it. Hyperbola, hyperbola curve formed by the intersection of a plane with a double cone. Extravagance is another word for it, huh? Hmm. 
Interesting. Dave and Ron bot is a thing if you want terrible jokes. Why do we need to publicize that on my stream? I, ha I went through years of having to listen to those guys. All right, so now this is looking a bit more like metal. We have introduced a shadow. We are following the curve of the plate because it's definitely bulging out in a rounded pattern. And because we are making our highlight round, guys, right, and making our shadow a little bit rounded also, notice that now we can definitely see that this, this is telegraphing as a rounded plate that sticks out like a belly. That's true, planer. That's true. I can still sigh and roll my eyes. So we've got the belly and that looks good and that's in line with what we've got going on up here. I maybe need to bring some more light into this. So yeah, this is NMM troubleshooting guys where we're trying to figure out how to get all this stuff to read right on this weird on these weirdly shaped pieces, right? So really we could have titled this NMM on weirdly shaped pieces. Yeah, it also would not be a Reaper stream without the sighing and eye rolling at the jokes. Exactly. There we are. And trying to figure this one out. Probably need to put a kind of a highlight there. It's again, just blocking in. When you're going with this with a strip like this, you're probably going with alternating bands, and then you've got a bit of an under reflection here. There's not much light down in here, in the e old armpit, but you probably want to drop a little tiny bit of light into there anyway because his arm is up, so there would be light reflecting back up. What I might do here is put an actual orange glow. Um, if I decide to do like a say a, a glowing OSL effect coming up from like maybe he's near like a brazier or something um, on the ground uh, then I would want to put that orange you know glowing all the way up and down this leg I don't know if I want to do that he's complicated enough I mean you can really make a model look amazing with lighting effects like that but there does come a point where you have to ask yourself if the model is way complex for that um, like sometimes I think that trying to do OSL on a, what is already a very complicated model is just overdoing it uh, some people may, however, look at that and say challenge and uh, wholeheartedly embrace it. So. So again, blocking in, trying to figure out where my light's going to be. I'm trying to bring it out. Try to make your highlight the same shape as the surface that you're trying to suggest. So that, uh, you are bringing out like it so it looks real so you bring out the volume of it with nmm you have a very good opportunity to do that to suggest volume and shapes of of areas with any highlight you do but i think with metal it's even can be even more striking because you're almost always bringing your highlights up to white I lost some of my highlight there Then we've got kind of an under reflection down here. And who knows down in here. Now down here in this hollow, I'm just kind of messing around trying to figure out what I want. I want to bring out, I want to bring out a little bit down there, but this is going to be overshadowed by so much. So it's not going to get a main highlight. It's going to really be in shadow. It's just going to catch a little light, I think. <laughs> Challenge not accepted, huh, Val? Uh, 
I thought it would be two mathematicians, mathophile. One to screw in the light bulb and the other one to show the work. This comes from my high school class where they insisted that we had to always show our work. Could not just make a commonsensical judgment call. Hmm. Okay, so that comes down like that. What I'm getting here with this big black shadow is actually the underside of this piece of metal. So I need to bring that out. Kind of analyzing like where these highlights and shadows are, what they're a part of. It's interesting to look at it on the camera because then I can see where the big holes are. So this is an angular piece of metal here, this big old strap. Kiri ran away. I'm a little suspicious. Kiri, you're not like having a moment, are you? Sometimes I don't like keeping the door open during stream. She gets ex she gets interested in something outside and wanders off. And the next thing I know, there's uh, time to rush Kiri outside, and I only just barely catch it out of the corner of my eye. Kiri dog. She's like not listening. We're not listening. Selective hearing Kiri. Selective hearing Kiri has a uh, has kicked in. You would swear the dog is deaf until you like crinkle something that has to do with food and then the next thing you know there's a dog there so there we go so we've gotten in some kiri would you go check on her honey if you have a second i know you're working just wondering if she's with her dog tv or check on her. oh there she back. is good girl you came back yay not deaf after all She's like, sorry, mom, the dog TV was too interesting. It's far more interesting than your stream. I, I don't know, Twisted Oma. Math about that joke presumes that the competence of groups of mathematicians that everyday tasks increases with group size, but my experience suggests that the obverse is true. <laughs> well said, my love. Hmm. <laughs> Alrighty, now I'm going to try to put in really dark shadow here. Now, one thing I do need to remember uh, is I have to ask, like, how reflective versus how dark is my armor? Thanks for the ReaperCon link, guys. Remember, ReaperCon Live is coming next weekend. Bloodstone. Uh, yeah, the, um, uh, what is it? The, it's the teal. Oh, it was the teal in HD. Hawk turquoise. Oops. Um. Or uh, whatever it was, the brilliant, brilliant, I it was a turquoise. Um, it was close. Yeah, yeah, you have to show the hands so they know that there's no treats, right? Well, our dog TV involves Kiri going and looking out the window at all the dogs in the park across the street. Bright turquoise. Yes, thank you, Zero. Hawk turquoise was the GW version. Technically, I'm trying to think. I mean, we have a lot of turquoises. But I don't know on intensity. I tend to just mix my um, clear green and uh, clear blue or my thalo green and thalo blue and then add a tiny bit of like black and white to it to give it a little coverage. But yeah, I mean, when there's a color, I think the HD one was the closest you'd get to Bloodstone. And sadly, that went out of print. But you could ask Sadie if she could bring it back. We still have the formula for old Bloodstone and for that HD. Could be a good suggestion for her. Oh, yeah, Ultra Squid. I'm sure it is. I think I've even heard of it. So I hang out with dog groups. But uh, I don't I, I don't think that watching television is actually a, a healthy thing. So I would never encourage my dog to do it. Hmm. 
I do not believe that dogs need endless stimulation. I don't believe humans need it either. Alrighty. So we're getting that kind of blocked in. So right now I've got a lot of light in this armor. And so it's... Uh, Essentially what we're trying, what we're saying then is that the armor is very dark, but it's a very reflective. Um, that's kind of the effect that we're getting right now with all of this light in here. Uh, and if I want this armor to read a lot darker or duller, then I would need to very much shrink down my highlights, make them much smaller. Um, and that would be the way to do that. I'm not sure that I want to. I'm kind of uh, enjoying the look of this right now. It is a little more dull in person than it is on camera. Our camera's really popping those white highlights. So let's see. Let's minimize this just a little. I need to thin my blue liner down a little bit more. Get it transparent. The other nice thing about do using blue liner for something like this is because the liners do go transparent really easily, um, you can glaze with them very nicely. They, uh, they go to a glaze level easily and uh, they work that way well. Oh, was Valandar asking? Yeah. Yeah, the starter kit or the Learner Pink kit one. Yeah, I believe cats would watch TV, Pendrake, because my old cat, um, really old cat, long ago, I used to have a saltwater fish tank, and uh, she loved to watch the fish in it. So that was my, that was the cat TV. So if, if cats will watch an aquarium, then cats would watch a TV. Some will, yes. Yeah, not all. Not all dogs will watch TV either. Like, Kiri has no interest in TV, but Leo used to watch the Westminster Dog Show with me. Oh, Valandra, that's terrible. <laughs> yes, everything to do with the being a cat. Yes, I would agree. So if we wanted this armor to be shiny, but much darker and not catching as much light, we would just do more spot highlights and we wouldn't do as broad highlights. We'd shrink our highlights down. So like I'm doing, taking some pure white and doing some spots right now. I'll do a spot. I've got kind of a strong spot right down here, but I'll do a little bit more. The stronger you bring up those highlights, the more it, the more the shiny will stand out. I need to kind of blend that in though. <coughs> Didn't seem as smoky out here today. I have not checked to see if the fires are getting contained or not, or if they've just moved on to a slightly different area. I was very sad that uh, Big Basin, which is a state park, um, was one of the areas affected by this fire. And actually, Dave and I were there not long ago. So I'm really glad I got to go before things got burned down. This shows that nothing is permanent. Everything changes. Squirrel video. Ah, cloudy sea. Clouded sea. Um, if we didn't have a wet sample, how different is it, Casmania? Because uh, normally if we're going to call something by the name, that means we are using the direct formula. But if Sadie couldn't find a wet sample of it, then she only made it to formula and it's very likely to have a slight amount of shift. It will still be the right, the same amount of pigments though. And the same like ratio of pigments. More grayer, less as dark. Yeah, so it's possible that we didn't have the wet a wet sample of it, and so then since we didn't have direct direct compa comparison, that Sadie made it to formula, and uh, just the ratio of white in our base can shift that. That's why we always 
try to keep uh, samples, but when it's an out of print color, we may have lost it or it may, you know, just have gone, it may be somewhere non-obvious. Um, so if we don't have a sample, then she's just going to make it to formula. Uh, that's where you get shift. That's why Reaper keeps a, a sample and we adjust. And that's why you need somebody other than a computer to be a paint mixer. It's why you need a human to do that task because the uh, the bases will vary slightly within their parameters, which are not as tight as ours. And so uh, you need a human to adjust for this. And sometimes you'll get a batch of pigment that may not be just not quite as strong, maybe, you know, uh, because again, they'll have parameters and they won't necessarily be as tight as our parameters. We want to have a precise match. They aren't concerned with the precise match. They're concerned with good enough. So... Ah, Twisted Oma. Yeah, I saw that there was, like, hurricane action coming in. Oh, um, yeah, Brian Blue. Um, 90.55. Nomad Zeke. It's obvious. Yeah. It's an obvious one. That's as close as I could get. It's, it's, a, it's a close enough. Like, if you're looking for that kind of sort, sort of soft navy with a bit of green in it, that's Brian. I just, I kept the Brian part of the name to kind of indicate that it was in the spirit of that earlier pro paint, which was one of my, um, more, I liked that pro paint quite a bit. So that's why I wanted to bring it, bring it back a bit. I'm still kind of suffering here with this NMM. Not thrilled. With, well, that's all right. It's just not awesome. Not awesome. That's all right, though. All right, so bringing in some light, bringing in some light. I want my brightest highlights to be on the front. I want to bring in a little more light on the hat and then bring in my darks around it. So right down the middle, a little bit of pure white. Then I've got to bring in a shadow, so I'm grabbing my pure black. I want that shadow to be right next to this. And then I want a bit of a highlight to come back up. Mommy learned math differently. <laughs> oh, there's plenty of those, Cybstorm. Like, whenever you get, um, not, not in any of the Reaper lines, uh, because I, I chose those colors, but like in our, in our, um, like Pathfinder line, I'm certain there's a color I didn't like that I made anyway. I have to look, I think, I think some of the metallics, I was just like, eh, but then I'm not a huge metallics fan to begin with. I'm trying to think if there was anything, but usually when I make a color, I'm very happy with it. Like I, I'm making it for a reason. I don't, the only d color I dislike is mint green. So mint green is the one that I would normally say, except that's not true because mint green is a great highlighter for blues. I, I tell you this side, it's not, it's not the color that puts me off on a color. It's the usage. So when a color comes out that I feel has no use or very little functional use in mini painting, because maybe it's just a weird off shade. I can't imagine what you'd use it for. There's already five other colors that do it. That's when I don't like. That's when I actually don't like a color. Because as long as a color has a use and a function and is, is really good for X or Y, then I think the color is cool. But the minute that you get a color in there that I'm just like, why? <laughs> and, and often it is a metallic. Often it is metallic. A lot of the wonky metallics are, are not terribly useful. And so at that point, it's a novelty color. And that's uh, actually why I'm not a big fan of like fluorescent colors things like that. It's like, well, why would I use, the, what would I actually use this for? Right. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't dislike any color for being a color, but there are colors that I find, uh, like that would be more difficult for people to work with because they don't have a really good use. And those colors I feel like are my least favorite colors. Most useless color. Oh, I can't really say it, Nomadzy, because it's not one I made. 
Let's see. Well, wait, maybe I do have a useless color in my line. What did I use? What did I make that was useless? I'm trying to think. Thinking back over all the colors, all the colors I've done. Probably something in the later ranges. Hmm, no, that one's okay. Hmm. 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 See, I try so hard to make everything useful. I mean, I'm more likely to pick, like, out of all of them, like, the novelty colors, like, um, Prom Night Pink. Useless. Or, or close to it. I mean, technically you could use it to highlight a red metallic, but you'd be f so much better off just adding pearl white in to do that. Stop, Ed will want to dump it. <laughs> well, it's like a, an odd off color anyway. It was made to be a promo color, Prom Night Pink. Well, orange is difficult to use for a whole different, like, it's, but it's not unuseful. You need it, right? You need it for things like fire giants and hellhound fur and stuff like that, right? You need oranges. Um, and for red hair, you need oranges, things like that. But a color that you just, when would you ever use it? Why would you, you know? Yeah, I suppose ultra squid. I mean, that's one way to do it. But for me, I'd rather add the white because that's the way a highlight in nature would do, right? So that depends on your style, right? If, you're, if you've are if you got like a more manga style, like I want to say um, Rex Grange is a good, a good example of this, where he's got a very poppy, like anime uh, almost style. Uh, and then I could see using like fluorescent colors as a final highlight as opposed to white. I'm a much more naturalistic painter. So I, I prefer things to like look like they are in nature and you don't see things in nature highlighting with fluorescence. You see them highlighting, you know, toward a, being like kind of almost washed out by glare, right? They're lightened and they're changed. Um, and so you, it's, it's a philosophy, right? It's like, I, I like to go for realism in my painting as much as I can, but a lot of people don't. Uh, Paizo selected all the Pathfinder colors and pit. They sent us the, uh, whenever we do a contract, my stipulation is that you send me all the swatches and names. Um, so send me the Pantone colors and I will match them. Pantone, uh, you can't use the Pantone formulas, although sometimes it will give you a clue as to how to arrive at the color. Uh, cause Pantone is of course inks, which is very different from pigments, but it at least gives me an exact swatch to match. Uh, and you really need that when you're doing a contract for someone, you need that. Ex this is exactly the color we want. So that then you match that color and it gets approved. Um, so Paizo gave us all the colors cause that was what, that was the stipulation on doing the line. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't going to try to come up with the Paizo colors for them. They needed to tell me what they wanted. And in a lot of cases, a lot of the colors they came up with were, were colors I would not have made. Um, but now really like. So like those off greens, like, um, Medusa and, uh, Boggard, like those off greens are really weird. And I probably would never have put them out because I would be unsure of usage, but the one now that they're out, I actually really like them, um, because they are really naturalistic. They're, they're like really good for like vegetation and reptiles and stuff like that. But it's something that I might not have thought of right away. So I actually got to say that. In general, I, I don't even, I'm trying to think. Some of the, the only reason I find some of the Pathfinder, I don't find the Pathfinder metallics uh, um, without use. I find them a little bit redundant because there's only so much you can do with metallic flakes. And so a lot of their colors are very similar to colors that already exist. But I think you're going to get that. You're going to get that overlap across paint lines, across paint companies. Everybody's working with the same sort of flake because it's the sort of flake that works in water-soluble paints. So you're going to get colors that are very close to each other. I'm trying to think. See, but even the colors that I think of that like maybe aren't like there are some triads where I feel like maybe that the highlight isn't as useful as it could be or in line with being a good highlight for what it is supposed to be a highlight for. But then then I find that I like that color for other things like jade green is a good example and pale violet red. Those are two highlights that in order to make them work, you really need to mix them with their mid-tone first. Um, but that doesn't make them bad because I actually have used both those colors as base colors for doing a different, different thing. Like using pale violet red as a base for pink is really good. Um, you know, so, so you have that also. I'm trying to think. 
I think some of the holiday colors uh, are not are not different enough. Like I would wish that I could have made something a little more different. But you really are limited. Like the more new colors, quote unquote, you try to come out with, the more you're just kind of going over the same territory with a slightly different twist. And that's what became so hard after making all of the colors for Reaper is finding a new twist on things that was useful. Because although people are perfectly happy to use your colors, you know, when you bring out a whole bunch of different colors, um, yeah, if you, yeah, if you like that sort of thing, fluorescents can be great for highlights. I find them hard to work with and it like, like I said, not very natural. So I tend to steer away from them, but it's up to you guys. Like that's, that's my painting style, which is very different from everybody else's painting style, right? Everybody's got a different shtick. Um, I mean, fluorescence could be useful in sci-fi cyberpunk schemes. I mean, they are really super bright, um, nathophile. Then the different, then it just comes down to how you're going to highlight and shade them realistically. Um, because you are in real life, if you had something that was a fluorescent color and it got hit by bright light, like, you know, out, just, just like a bright light that a normal light source it would change color, right? You wouldn't really see the fluorescentness. The, the point of the fluorescence is that it shows up under black light, right? So like, if you're going to do something like that, like say, um, if you guys are, uh, you know, I'm an Overwatch fan. So Sombra, uh, like her whole shtick, she's got some, uh, in, in Dorado, they've got a, a, the Soldier 76 short and they have like fluorescent face paint, right? So when the lights go out, you actually see the fluorescent paint, face paint glow. So if you were going to do a diorama, for example, or a model that was meant to be kind of in the dark, except for their fluorescent paint or their fluorescent clothing, that could be really cool. But the reason that I, I still don't like, that doesn't really sell me on fluorescence is that then that's a, such a limited usage. I don't like paints that are like one use wonders. I like, I'm, I'm the Alton Brown of mini paints. Okay. I want a multitasker. I want a paint I can use in all sorts of stuff. Um, so that's what I look for, for my own collection is I look for a paint that I can either do a whole lot with or mix a whole lot with. So yes, just uh, Alton Brown of not, no longer the Bob Ross of mini painting. Now I'm the Alton Brown of mini painting and Alton is actually, I'm an Alton fan girl. So that works. Most useless, useless gadgets? No, but I've, I've kind of, uh, I saw a lot of it on, um, Good Eats. I mean, he covers a lot of it, uh, on, on Good Eats Nomad. He hates unitaskers with a passion and I have to, I have to be with him because it's the unitaskers in our kitchen that I never reach for with the exception. And I believe he agrees with me on this with the exception of the garlic press, which is a, a brilliant, brilliant device and God, I hope never to be without one again. No, uh, see, Empit? Garlic press. The garlic press, although a unitasker, is tremendously useful. Because if you use the amount of garlic I do, you use that sucker every day, sometimes twice a day. Oh, the fire extinguisher? <laughs> well, Alton can bite me because for years I pressed and uh, chopped my own garlic by hand and it's a pain in the butt and I don't want to go back to it. Yeah, a lot of people buy it by the jar, but the problem I have with that is that you can get it pre-chopped and pre-chopped fine, but you really can't get that mushy consistency that spreads out better through the food. We have an awesome garlic press. David had an amazing, like, choice, like, did a, did a wonderful, made a wonderful choice of garlic press. It's so easy to clean. It's so fast. Like, I, I love this thing, seriously. And we do really use it every day because I use a lot of garlic when I cook. And we make guacamole a lot. And we put guac in our garlic in our guac. So, ah, I have an upper surface here that I did not paint like an upper surface. This is an upper surface, so it needs to be lighter. Uh, yeah, but you can also grind spices in a coffee grinder, so it is kind of a multitasker, or it can be a multitasker. Although I doubt you'd want spicy coffee, but you never know. Depends on the spice that you're grinding. Now I need a little bit more shadow there. So we're just tuning, fine tuning all of this little, these little guys now. I think we've got some, uh, some shinies going on here. It's, it's again, it's maybe a little bit too shiny. I may end up putting a glaze over everything. Um, yeah, I could survive on guac only also, Val. It's a very keto thing to do.
All right, I'm actually going to make a glaze of blue liner and hit this whole thing with it. Let's see here. Probably about one to two paint to water at that point. Maybe one to three. Very watery. I don't mind if it takes it takes uh, the highlights down a bit because I can come back and re-highlight them. That's a cool image. Yeah, good grinders do get expensive, but worth it. You grow your own garlic? Awesome, Dragon Eye. We don't have enough, um, we're running into the, we don't have enough sun on our patio to keep some of our herbs alive thing. I'm just glazing this over the whole area, painting it over the whole thing that I just did. See how that takes it down? Makes it look much more blue-black. Gonna do it on the front of this too. Gonna do it on the hat. What this is, is gonna knock everything down but keep my blends intact. It's gonna make my blends look better. See how that darkens it down a lot? Now it doesn't look nearly as screaming bright. But you keep your um, highlight and shadow placement. Hey, Roll to Explode, thanks for the raid party. We're, uh, thanks for the raid party, rather, of 13. So you're the, the lucky, unlucky raid party. Hey, everybody, I'm Anne. I work for Reaper. We're painting a fire giant dude. His sword is back here. It's kind of cool. We've been painting him for a while. I kind of swap back and forth between products on this screen uh, on this stream, so i kind of been on a fire, fire giant kick all week. We may do something a little bit different. Tomorrow I may go back to Juliana the Herbalist and almost finish her. I need to do her plants. I need to figure out how I want to do her plants. Do, 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 do. Just totally seeing here what we got. Sorry, everybody's talking about, about stuff. About Herbalit stuff and uh, things. Yeah, we don't have enough. We have a nice mint plant. It was beautiful when it came here, but then it just started slowly getting little speckles on its leaves and looking not happy. But we do not get full sun on our patio at any given time of day, so it's always only partial or mostly shade. So it's not really good for a very um, light intensive herb like mint. Some of our herbs are doing great. Oregano, the oregano is like loving it, but. Oh, good, roll one. Sweet. Excellent. That's fantastic. I hope you have fun with them. Yeah, I was painting. I guess I can show you this then. Roll one. Hold on. I finished my commissar commission. She's going to go out in the mail later this week. I probably have to take her to the post office tomorrow. But I wanted to show you that I finished her since you're a 40k fan. And my favorite part is the the pipe. <laughs> I hate to say it, but the bronze pipe is like my favorite part. <laughs> it's so silly. But um, but yeah, I painted her to box art by request. So uh, so she is a a, a a copy of the the box art, except that I use non-metallic metal over the whole thing instead of going with partial metallics, partial NMM. Um, so yeah, I love the pipe. Yeah, we keep it in its own planter, but it's just not doing well, Twisted Oma. It really is a full sun plant, and so, yeah, so this is our, this is my, I do commissions. Are you talking about our mint? Yeah, I'm talking about our mint. So there, there you go, you 40k people who came in with roll one. And wait, I'll show you my Tyranid, too, because he hasn't gotten any love. So this is also a commission for the same person. He also, he does a, he does a few different armies. So there's Mr. Tyranid, also painted to box art, and the little tiny striations on the back of the shell were annoying, and part of the box art thanks games workshop. So yeah, so I do, sometimes I'll paint this sort of thing. I did the commissar over on my own stream, uh, which is uh, twitch.tv slash painting big, uh, and I'll probably be doing a little bit more GW stuff in the future. I try to switch it up between like busts and I do stuff I'm working on my own personal projects, but I also am doing commissions on there, so that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, my, I like the Tyranid a lot. He was fun to paint. He took a while because of all the, the armor butts, the armor bits, but he was uh, pretty good. So yeah, so see how that glaze knocked everything down? It looks much more blue now. It's still showing as shiny and reflective, but it's much, it's more dull, right? So that whole glaze of the blue liner really brought everything darker, which is good. I want, I want that color to be dark overall because when I bring all this gold up, really shiny and the orange and everything and the red that's all going to come up so i want some contrast i need that blue black to stay dark and if i'm going to if i'm going to keep it dark then it needs to be dark over most of the surface so now what i can do 
after that glaze is I can come back with my pure white and reintroduce just a little bit, a tiny bit of the brightest spots to make things look like they are shinier. You want that pure, pure white highlight on a shiny surface without exception. With the exception, actually there is one exception that's hair, which is shiny, but usually not like as shiny and reflective as metal. So you can go up to near white on hair. I will go up to pure white on blonde. But uh, now I'm just putting just a little bit of pure white here and there to bring that light back up. Um, I probably, I don't have the Reaper bus and I already did um, one of the Reaper buses featured in one of my Patreon things, the, the blonde hair and uh, transparent cloth. I used the uh, Julie Guthrie um, dragon, dragon uh, lady for the, from the Kickstarter. But otherwise until it releases, I might do the elf dude at some point on my own stream. But I've got so many, so many cool busts from other companies, Math and File. I probably don't, I don't need to go looking for busts to put on my own stream. I've got too many uh, to work on as it is. David will vouch for this. I have boxes of them. All right, just putting little tiny touches. You saw how I just added a little tiny touch of pure white there and there. And all these little touches of white bring the shiny back, right? So that's, that's coming along. I'm liking this now. Good. Oh, for this stream. Yeah, after they come out, I might order some. Like, I won't order the Julie Guthrie because I've already painted it. And I don't really want, I don't like to, usually don't like to repaint unless it's an amazing bust. If it's a really amazing bust or a model, then I've had so much fun painting it, then I might repaint. But that's like, in a blue moon, that happens. Like, there's one Games Workshop model that's happened with and one bust that that has happened with. In my memory. <laughs> So it is very rare for me to repaint. So I would suspect that if I did anything on stream, I would do the Elven Ranger bust. That gives me a lot of um, freehand to do on his cloth. And also a good face to do. So that would be most likely. Crowley, what was that? Oh, which GW minis might I do? Well, I've mostly got Eldar. But, um... The guy who I did the the commissar and the gene stealer for uh, said he'd probably have more for me in like November or December. So at that point, I uh, I'll probably feature whatever he gives me. Though I've got I don't know I've got some GW models that I just plain like. I've also got my golden demon entry, and that is one of the uh, Stormcast Eternals, um, Crowley. So I may work on that on the stream. That's actually would be fun. It, the stream would probably actually be a good way to work on that Golden Demon piece because that, when Golden Demons got canceled, and even before that, I had kind of lost inspiration with it. But doing it on stream would be fun. I also need to go back to my Valkyrie. Valkyrie project that I started. I don't know. Going back and forth. The problem with the Valkyrie is she needs more green work and, and often I feel like that's maybe not what people come to a painting painting stream for. I feel like I've done a lot of green stuff on the stream already since I was started with that model and she needs so much conversion. So now I'm doing the outside of that, uh, this diamond design. And mostly I'm just blocking it in with a slightly lighter blue. This is a mix, I would say about a three to one blue liner and white. And uh, I'm just lightening things and then I'm going to figure out where my main highlights coming down from. And where I want that light to be. It's probably going to be. Oh, show the glaze color. Sure. It's just straight blue liner with a bunch of water in it. It's probably. It's even a thick. It's even a pretty thick glaze. Like if you see. It's got some definite body. You could use this as a wash probably even. Um, but I wanted that. Because I really felt like I needed to pop this down. I wanted it to go darker. So I just put that over the whole surface. That's why you could really see it when I was putting it on. Is because it was actually pretty thick for a glaze. Let's see here, Fire Giant Dude. All right, let's go and continue on that. Where do I want my highlight? Now I need to ask myself, where's the light? The light is falling mostly on this side, so that means that this is probably my upper surface. So I want my strongest highlight to be there. 
So here you'd have to decide, like, is it just a spotlight, in which case this inner surface would be highlighted, or is it mostly a light source coming from up here, in which case this outer surface would be highlighted? And I think I'm going with a general highlight because I want these shoulders and this arm. I've got, already got a good strong highlight on this arm. So that implies that the light source is more diffused and only gently from that direction. There are uh, kind of some dents and imperfections in the surface of this uh, piece of metal, but I'm going to paint right over them to begin with because I want to establish the metal look. I want to make sure that it looks shiny before I add those tiny little nails and stuff. So again, we're gonna go and block in our highlights. Real rough, we're not gonna worry about blending. We're just gonna to try to make, this whole surface needs to be lighter so that, and the light will catch here and bounce because this is where it's gonna be facing your, your eyeball. We also might have a little bit of bounce if we can make a really thin line on this edge. This is where I love this Raphael and my Da Vinci's. It lets me do this super thin line with this tiny, tiny, tiny little tip. I love that stuff. And you notice I'm not just drawing a straight line. That's very difficult. You really can't do it, but you can do like a series of little dashes and see I blurfed. No big deal. If I'm going to blurf, I'd rather blurf on that side because I can just line dark right under it but you can totally dash your way to a more or less straight line. And then we bring back our shadow and fix the blurf that I did. Now I'm gonna do a straight line. And the reason I can do a straight line in one stroke here, guys, is that I've got this red part. The red part actually sticks up, so I can put my brush right around the edge and kind of press into it and do that in one stroke. So that was not actually as skillful and awesome as it looked. I was totally using the model as an assist. Oh, as far as which one? Oh, um, one GW Mini would have been the original Logan Grimnar, the one uh, in Terminator armor where he's kind of running. It was the most dynamic Terminator sculpt that had been done at the time it came out, which I think was back in the early 2000s, late 90s, late 90s, probably late 90s, early 2000s. And I did it for a commission, and then I did it for an eBay piece because I really enjoyed it. He was just a really nice, smooth, sharp sculpt, and he was totally a pleasure to paint. Um, blue grays are really fun and easy for me to highlight, and so I, I thoroughly enjoyed every part of him. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a cheat, Val. Um, I'm still a paint goddess, but there are, there are limits. Um, but yeah, so that was the only model that I repainted there for fun. I mentioned the Dark Sword one, the Daenerys, um, 54 millimeter Daenerys coming out of the fire that I did an extra one of after I did Jim's. I did one for George, but that was because I wanted to do a miniature for George R. R. Martin, so that was different. Um, but the uh, the only bust that makes me want to repaint is actually this one, is actually my Sword of Dawn piece that you all have seen on my stream. Uh, she's been super fun. I like everything about her except her arm guards, uh, but that'd be easy to fix, uh, i.e. slice off all those stupid little um, pointed things. And so I, I may very well acquire a second uh, sort of dust, sort of dawn bust. She actually is nice enough that she makes me want to paint her again. And since the color scheme on that one was decided upon with in conjunction with my mentoree, my the person I'm mentoring and painting her with, um, I feel like I would maybe choose a different color scheme for myself if I painted her. So that would be another incentive to me to repaint her. Again, highlighting, just bringing my highlights back. Going Since I have all these colors open, I'm, I'm constantly tweaking all my areas. I do need to go and uh, tackle this side as well, since it's not going to have as much light. But it's easier to do my lighted area first and get that set so that I like it. And then I can go and wrestle with the area that's not getting quite as strong light or getting mostly reflected light. Yeah, it's a little bit more. A little bit of bounce light. Technically, I probably want to um, change the color of this bounce right here. It's going to probably go a little bit orangey because of the beard right here. So if I wanted to do that, I would just grab an orange. Probably going to do... Volcanic's not going to look light enough. So I'm going to grab some sunrise orange and glaze it over that and see if I can make it look like that. 
But yeah, it's just every once in a while I'll paint, every once in a long while I'll paint a model that I just enjoy so much that I'm like, I could paint this again. Let's see here, where's my orange? Get a little water in it. Don't need much water because orange goes transparent very easily. So, orange over that. There we go. A little bit more maybe. Let that dry. Glaze the orange over it again. There we go. So we're getting a little bit of an orangey highlight. I might even try to grab a little bit of white and mix it with my orange and uh, make sure that that highlight has some orange in it decisively. You can do it either way. You can do your highlight and then you can glaze over it or you can bring the orange directly into the metal. And that way, now we have a highlight that's uh, a little bit off and it's just reflecting the, the beard light there because you've obviously got some strong light bouncing here. So it would pick up that color. And we also could probably, when we get this gold part here done, we could probably introduce a little bit of that into here maybe. You know, we can think about it anyway. We don't want it to be too much because you don't want to lose the contrast, but you might get some reflection there. So... So that's looking okay. What do we got? We got, we're almost done. I'm just at this point, just kind of touching up. There's another surface down here. A lot of these shapes are big and blocky. And so they actually, they're very thick. You can see the underside of this is really thick, but that means you do want to paint it. You could technically just leave it dark, paint it dark, but it's much more fun. paint it a bit. <laughs> oh, I missed a comment. There were too many comments. Yes, I will be doing a painting big stream this afternoon. I have yet to decide what I want to work on. Um, I may do snake ladies base on my own stream, finish it up, get it ready for its, uh, for its waterfall and foliage because it needs to get done and I haven't wanted to do it on this stream because I like to do painting on the reaper stream rather than green work so we may work on snake lady she's actually one of those models where I like her enough that I don't mind putting in my own time on her trying to get this stuff going on I think I want that one to be a better line but yeah, so this afternoon, uh, we don't have a Reaper stream right now going in that slot. So I will uh, be streaming around 4.30 Central. Um, often, sometimes I'm early, sometimes I'm a little later. It depends on like Kiri and, you know, the scheduling and lunch and all the rest of it and what I'm working on. Uh, but around that time, I will go live on twitch.tv slash painting big. And uh, yeah, probably work on Snake Lady Space, getting that that kind of a, the raised area for the waterfall sculpted in. Maybe some stones. Make sure I've got a little pond kind of laid out for the waterfall to go into. Essentially doing like micro basing detail. Because <laughs> I don't have much room on that base. So it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to make everything fit in and look good. Wanted to kind of suggest that stuff. But yeah, so I need to find time to do it. I don't want to do it on this stream, so I'll probably do it on my own stream. And I like Snake Lady a lot, so like I said, I don't mind. She might actually be a miniature I keep. <laughs> I like her a lot. Depends on how she all turns out. I had thought about selling her, but I really like her. I have a model up for sale right now anyway, so I don't really need another model up for sale. Patrons, if you are, if my patrons here are $10 and up, I did put a mini up for auction. So far it has only one bid, so you could get it cheap. It's my dark elf bust with the cool tattoo. Hey, 
And yes, if you are on the Patreon, it is totally legal to make yourself a $10 backer for a month so you can bid on the mini. <laughs> it's one of my perks for my higher tier patrons that if I if I sell anything, they get first, first uh, call at it. And usually I put things up pretty cheap for me. Usually I don't take on a commission for under $250, um, but I put up my auctions for lower because I want to encourage people to get collections so they can use those miniatures to kind of, uh, to study from, to get better. So I actually put my current model up for half of what I normally charge just to encourage my patrons and to make it easier for people to collect. Let's see here. Um, I have very few MPIT. And the reason is that or from my earlier career days, I sold everything. The last time I freelanced, there wasn't a thing as such a thing as Patreon. And so to survive and to pay rent and to uh, actually have food to eat, uh, I pretty much had to sell everything I painted. And so the only model I kept from that time, other than my, my, like, my first ever like gaming uh, more time models, but the only model I really kept from that time is uh, my first ever Golden Demon winner. That was my first national level award. Uh, and so I had I, I got offered a thousand bucks as I was walking out of the hall for that model and I turned it down. And that hurt because I could have used a thousand bucks at that time. But um, I decided not to sell it. So I still own him. He is actually on the shelf here in this room in our office. We've got a couple of different shelves. Um, we have a case in this office and we've got the case for the really nice stuff like our like crystal brush winners or notable pieces that we've done or um, stuff from our from David's personal collection. Uh, like David had, David, this is why I bring up that having a collection can help you get better is because David had collected a bunch of models from some of his favorite painters like Sergio and Kirill and Jennifer Haley and he has a collection out in our case in, in the main room. Um, and my, like things like my crystal brush entry, my sacrifice model, which is one of the best things I've done that, that goes out there also. Um, so the best stuff, but then also the collection stuff that we've got from other painters, that's just inspiring to own and to kind of study, uh, to kind of get a sense of their style, things like that. There are still a few painters we would like to own that we don't own. But yeah, so I think what I've got is I've got Sacrifice. Actually, Sacrifice and Mr. Grumpy are currently sitting up top on my desk here because I was using them as examples um, recently. But Sacrifice, I own. My Golden Demon Warner, I own. Mr. Grumpy, I own. Uh, one of my Confrontation Wolfen that I painted for the Lone Star Figure Show um, down in Texas. Uh, I own him. I, I love Wolfen, so I wasn't going to sell him. Yeah, it was later on, too. That was when I was in, in Texas, so I wasn't... Uh, depending on freelance painting for my food. But yeah, I was very hardcore. It's funny because uh, when Kiri had puppies, I was the same way. Like people, you get in that mindset where you are just like, you don't get attached to things, even things you put a lot of emotional effort into. And uh, so when I, when Kiri had puppies, it was people were always like, don't you want to keep them all? And I'm like, no, not at all. Please get these things out of here. <laughs> so... I am very uh, willing to part with most of, most of my models. The ones that I keep are the ones that are milestones for me, where I feel like I learned something or I did something different for the first time. And that's, those are the ones that I keep of my own work. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, Derek. Well, you know, I've got one of your pieces, earlier pieces, because I have the Vitala or the dwarf that you painted um, when everybody did the Vitala model for me. Do we have a Derek model otherwise? Schubert? Um, I, I don't. I, you don't? I, like, he doesn't need any money, so if you want to buy a figure from him, he's like, nah, I'd rather just keep it. <laughs> See, Derek? I've tried multiple times. <laughs> David has tried multiple times to get a figure from you. <laughs> and But I have one, so there we go. At least we, At least I own a Derek Schubert. Good to see you. We're, we're working on the, uh, the uh, Blue Iron uh, NMM. Uh, today and I was talking about all sorts of things and stuff but people asked about which models I kept of my own collection Derek and I actually have a very very small collection because back in the day of course I was selling everything to get food um, 
So yeah, now, now guys, the Patreon is like my main means of support and it's just a game changer as a freelancer. I'll tell you that because it is like being able to get that money every month to be able to pay for stuff, you know, like my dog's meds <laughs> and my meds, things like that. Um, I'm back by the way, Miss Ann. Oh, cool. Is super important and it makes the freelancing so much less stressful. And I can, I feel like I can do some really good work for you guys and put out good content and uh, it's just, it's been a delight. So if you haven't looked at my Patreon, go look at it, patreon.com slash painting big. Uh, I have, I have as little as a $2 level. Um, and sometimes you'll get videos and sometimes you'll get PDFs. Um, but yeah, you can check it out. I have a, a little bit of free content up also. Thank you for the Patreon link planner. <laughs> DKS can be mugged after ReaperCon 2021 for figures. <laughs> Look out, Derek. They're, they're putting their sights on you now. Winning a Schubert is a rare accomplishment. Yes, and welcome back, Justin. So, yeah, we uh, I think we, we've made pretty good progress on this, guys, today. Like, we got some of this uh, dark iron really, really mapped out. I just have to, like, you know, catch up on the other side here. But what I figured I'd do is extend and finish this arm out so that we could kind of see, and, and the shoulder and stuff, kind of get a feel for how the whole model's going to look once we get this side done, and then we can extend it. I could work on both sides at once, but I find that when I'm working for you guys, it's better to just focus on a, on a smaller area, and then we can build out this side, this side if we like it, and then if we do like it, we can duplicate it over on here with his, uh, with his big volcanic sword. <laughs> but yeah, there we go. So now... Now, well, here, let me back up my camera a little bit. There we go. Get the palette out of frame. Get the card out of frame. And uh, we are, we're moving right along. So he's, yeah, we're coming together. So that's our progress for the day. It took about an hour after we got into it, I'd say, to fine tune and get this uh, non-metallic metal mapped out. But I'm liking the blue. Um, it really does give a nice cool counterpoint to the warmth of the rest of the model. And yet the model still stays a bit warm, you know, warm overall. So yeah, yeah. Pretty good so far. Pretty good. I'm glad you all came around and hung out. Yeah, this, the diamond area. Yeah, I, I was going to paint it red, I think. Um, I still need to fill in this red and see how I like it highlighted, but I'm going to highlight it with oranges. So I think it's going to go just fine. Um, since I'm going to highlight it with, with sunrise orange, uh, maybe even up to lantern yellow. I like to highlight red up to yellow. I like how it looks and a fire giant is a perfect way to do that red. So when I get down to these big diamonds, I need to take this mold line out first. Um, but when I get down to these big diamonds, we'll be doing each of those in like a red, going from a really dark red to a really like light, like yellow almost all the way through. Like the red that I used to love to do. I used to do, love to do a nine layer red that went all the way from like a cadmium red brown up to like a, a yellow white. Um, and I loved the look of that. So we'll try, why not go back? Why not do it again? Do we have anybody awesome to raid? Didn't we say, who did we say we didn't raid yesterday, but we wanted to raid today? Uh, I believe it was Michael. Yeah, Michael. Cause we didn't, we went over and did Zambies cause she was doing an anniversary. But uh, Michael would be a great one to rate, I think. Do you guys think so? I think it would be. Is he on, Justin? Let me see if he is. According to mine, actually, it doesn't look like he is. Ah, figures. That figures. That says that we have to grab these people while they're available. Rawr, exactly. But we do have Dices. We do have Dices. Is that the only choice we have? Is the Dices as far as our usuals? No, no as weird. Far as, our, as far as our usuals, yes. Okay. Alrighty. Well, okay. Then let's go over and raid Dices. We should look for some new 2D artists. Alrighty. Oh. That planer is giving us a link. Who's that planer? RPG company. Oh, that could be cool. Do you want to do that, Justin? Yeah, yeah, we can we can do it. Let's try it. Yeah, let's try them. Let's see. Okay, great idea. Thanks, Planer. They sound like they'd be right up our up right up our boat. Alrighty. Say hi to everybody and yes, catch me later this afternoon, 4 30 Central, over on my own, twitch.tv slash painting big. And I hope you all have a fantastic day, and we'll see you later. Bye. Thank you guys very much. Um...
Look forward to seeing you tomorrow for Anne's show again. Um, keep spreading the Reaper love. Keep being awesome. And thank you guys for coming out again, even though I wasn't really here. Thank you guys. <laughs>